think we should focus on it. What do those two words mean? What is the controversy about? Who is it between? Okay. We want to understand these things because our message will have power behind it if we know what it's about. Saying words is not enough. God can use that, but it's not enough. We're told in the book, The Great Controversy, that in the end time, just before probation closes, the people will be one, not because of the arguments, because those have already been given, but they will come in because of conviction. And that's what we need, is conviction, that no matter what anybody says, we have learned something from God, and it's going to stand, it's going to hold. So, the, the great controversy we know is between God and Satan. Okay. Now, Satan has masked his side of it by making just about Christ. But Christ is God. <laughs> okay. Satan says he'll serve the Father, but he won't serve Christ. Now, he also says secretly on the side, he won't serve the Father either. <laughs> and the reason he says it is because the Father is selfish. And he wants to be worshipped. He says he knows God is selfish because Satan says, I want to be worshipped. And the Father said, no. <laughs> so he says, the Father is selfish. That's the great controversy. Okay? So who's right? Well, we have it settled in our minds. That's why we're here. But we need to understand what it is God is doing to let this all work out. God has done something in His Word to reveal His character. And it begins in Genesis and works all the way through the book of Revelation. He is revealing his character, who he really is. And so, if we are paying attention when we're studying the Scripture, we will begin to catch God's idea. He has one idea through the Scriptures to reveal his character. And that one idea is like what several people have called a golden thread working its way all the way through. No matter what's happening, what's going on, that thread is in there in every age of man. God has used an expression to reveal himself. And that's what we're going to be studying. This is what we want to understand in the scriptures. That expression is the blood. Okay. Now, we may not have understood a lot about this in the past, but I hope that as we go through this biblically, that we will understand that God is revealing himself in those two words. And it's powerful if we can get a hold of this. And I'm sure we can. Because this is the one thing he wants us to know. The blood. So our approach is going to be to look for it in the Old Testament. We're going to take an overview today. And then we will focus on all these elements one at a time. But today we're going to look at it. In the Old Testament... And then we're going to look at the New Testament. There are people who don't believe it's in the Old Testament. <laughs> but it's there exactly the same way as in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we are going to focus on what Jesus said about the blood. And then we will look at what the apostles have written in all of the letters about the blood. And then we will take a look at what heaven thinks about the blood in the book of Revelation. Okay? 
So we're going to take quite an overview today, but I hope that this will be a foundation for what we're going to be doing as we go along. All right, I'm going to move through nine steps today. And I was surprised myself as they unfolded. What falls where in the numbers? The number seven is exactly right. The number nine is exactly right. We'll see what, what happens here today. <laughs> okay, we're going to begin with Genesis, the fourth chapter, verse four, in the Garden of Eden. The name in that verse is Abel. Okay? Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So Abel brought an offering. This is the first act of worship that we find in the Bible. That is the first specific mention of worship. And it involves the shedding of blood. Okay? So the very first thing that we read in Scripture after sin comes along is the shedding of blood. The firstling of the flock was offered. And in Hebrews 11.4, maybe we ought to look at that. Hebrews 11, verse 4. It said, by faith, Abel. Oh, here we go. <laughs> by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being, oh, uh, wait a minute, uh, yeah, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead yet speaketh. Okay. So, Abel pleased God by offering that sacrifice. The shedding of blood was pleasing to God. So immediately there's something very powerful happening in the scriptures. Right at the beginning, we're being told something of what is pleasing to God. And by the way, Abel did this not as a work. He did it through faith. <laughs> So faith is not something that came along after Jesus was on the earth. It's right there at the beginning. The blood and faith go together. But faith always does something. <laughs> faith can never be alone. Except in a lost person. <laughs> but faith in a Christian always does something. Faith can never be out there just hanging and never expresses itself. So the, what did faith do here? The blood. The blood. And it was pleasing to God. But something that many theologians have not noticed as they study this subject and that we know as a people is that this is not the first time the blood is mentioned in the Bible. It's very specific here and you can't miss it once you see it. But this just tells us if God did it once, He must have done it before and He must be always going to do it. So there was something before that points to this. What was that? Well, Adam is the first sinner, isn't he? We can't go back any further than that. <laughs> okay, so we have to go back to Adam and say, well, wait a minute, where's the blood? Well, the scriptures don't say anything about blood, but they do say something. When Adam and Eve sinned, they saw that there was a defect in themselves as they looked at each other, 
And so they put fig leaves all around them. And they must have been pretty big fig leaves in that garden. <laughs> they covered themselves. And I don't know about you, but I like to think of it as the first Halloween costume. Yeah, because they covered themselves. And when God called them out and said, uh, where are you? Where are you? They well, come out. They came out and there they were with these leaves all around them. And they expected that God wouldn't notice. <laughs> and they came out there, oh, well, here we are just doing our regular thing, you know. And God said, what have you done? Well, what do you mean? Here's these fig leaves all over the place. <laughs> and fig leaves, according to the Jews, are a symbol of hypocrisy. See, whenever they burned the fig wood, they were burning hypocrisy. And so here's Adam and Eve standing out there with these fig leaves covering them to cover their disobedience. Whenever a person today tries to cover their disobedience, they're putting on fig leaves. The same thing, and they expect that God won't know the difference. <laughs> but God did know the difference, and he says, hey, let's get rid of this. <laughs> He says, we have to get you some good clothes. And so, skins. Where did the skins come from? Some poor animal had to give up its skin for Adam and Eve. Now, that was not synthetic skin. That was real skin. And God didn't take a little piece off. That animal had to die. There's blood. Immediately after sin came, blood. An innocent victim had to pay the price so Adam could stay alive. And so there it is, right at the beginning. Blood, the lesson is quick. <laughs> okay, uh, beautiful question. Who killed the animals? Oh, what a question. <laughs> well, you can't find that out in Genesis. You have to wait until the priesthood develops to the sanctuary. And then God tells you who killed the animals. When a person went in for, with personal sin on them to the sanctuary, they had to go before a priest, and the priest looked for a perfect animal. Who did that animal belong to according to what God said? The person had to take something that belonged to himself and kill it. Do you get that? Something that belonged to him and no one else and kill it. We're going to come back to that thought. The priest handed that person a knife. The priest stretched the head of that animal towards the, towards the altar. And then the person with his own hand slit the throat of that animal that belonged to him. And that animal knew that person. That person had fed that animal and taken care of it. And that animal expected better treatment. And the animal was standing there saying, what, what are you doing to me? <laughs> and the person cut the throat. And the priest caught the blood in a little bowl. And the animal fell over and died. The person, for their own sins, killed that animal. Thank you. So immediately we learn there is no approach to God without the blood. Okay? 
It's utterly impossible to do anything in the direction of God without the blood. Now, we haven't even gotten past Genesis 3 and 4. <laughs> the innocent victim. There's a lot happening through there. All right, let's look at the second one. We'll go hundreds of years now to the flood. This whole world was destroyed because of sin. All the humans on this earth, except how many? Yeah, except eight people died in that destruction. After the flood, the very first thing on the new earth that happened was Noah making an offering, a burnt offering, blood. The new world began through the blood. It's kind of interesting as we think about the flood that there was water and blood. <laughs> okay? Water and blood. You just begin to see this down through the rest of the Bible. So the first recorded act of Noah after the flood is that burnt sacrifice. All right, let's move along here. The third thing we want to notice is Abraham and Isaac. I don't know if you have thought about it quite this way, but whose son was Isaac? It was God's son. You see, Abraham thought it was his son. <laughs> but God wanted to get that out of him. Wait a minute. This is not your son. This is a son by miracle. This is a miraculous son. He belongs to me. <laughs> and in order for Abraham to learn this, God said, kill him. He belongs to me. So Abraham had to learn the lesson of faith. This is not my son that God has told me to kill. And to offer on an altar in sacrifice. It's God's son. And God said, you're going to kill my son. What a lesson. That's exactly what we did. We killed God's son. And so you know the story. I'm not going to go through the story, but we just want to pick some things out here. That Isaac is a type of Christ. We know that. But we need to see how and why and how it works. We've got to see what's going on in that story. Well, finally, when it came time for the knife, we know it didn't happen. How come? Well, Isaac was a son of promise that the whole line, Jesus was going to start a whole race through him, a whole people. So he couldn't be dead and do that. So somehow he had to go through the death experience and still be alive. Because only through death could that people be made. And so we know what happened. Isaac said, well, if you're not going to put the knife in me, where's the sacrifice? <laughs> because he knew there had to be what? There had to be blood. He knew that. Without blood, nothing happens. And so we know that they looked around and there was a ram. Not a lamb. A ram, full grown, fully matured. You remember when Jesus in John, the 8th chapter, verse 58, he said, Abraham saw my day and was glad. He saw the ram. He didn't see the lamb only. He saw Jesus on the cross. 
And so there was the ram from God. They offered that ram. There was the blood and Isaac could live. The blood was there. And Isaac received life. And that life made a people. All right, so we see the blood on what mountain? Mount Moriah. Isn't that interesting? The blood was on Mount Moriah. That's exactly where Jesus was crucified. So we learn a little bit more here. We learn about the substitute. The ram took Isaac's place. Let's move on now. Let's go down the way 400 years. And we don't see one person now being delivered. We see Israel, the whole nation. Okay, we're down to the time of Egypt. And we must remember that not without blood does anything happen. This nation must now be delivered. And how was the nation delivered? On the doorposts, blood. Nothing happens without the blood. Now you'll notice it was on the doorposts. It was not in a jar someplace. It was not on the ground. It was on the place of going in and going out. And it's interesting the way the Bible says this. Let's look at Exodus 12:23. It says, for the Lord, and whenever you see the word Lord in your Bible capitalized like that, the real word there is the tetragrammaton. And scholars today say that means Yahweh, but I'm sorry, that's not what it says to me. Those letters are the name of God, Jehovah. I have looked all through the writings of Ellen White and I have never found the word Yahweh. Over 2,000 times she says Jehovah. You know, I think that if God had been displeased with her saying that, he would have mentioned something to her. <laughs> okay. So I don't care if all the scholars in the world say something else. I think we have an inside track on this. So when you see this word in the Bible, capital L, capital O, capital R, D, you put it in your mind. Jehovah. That's the personal name of God. Do you remember when we talked about the temptation of Eve? What the devil did to her, the very first thing he did was depersonalize the Godhead. He says, has God said? He didn't say, did your father say? He didn't say, did Jehovah say? God, a depersonalized being. And he hooked her. Don't get in the habit of thinking of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit as, as just titles. <laughs> God the Father has a name. Think about that. Jehovah. And don't get trapped in all these things that people get into. Oh, no. Jesus was Yeshua, and there was no Jehovah, and there was... Don't get into all of those things. 
Ellen White was a prophet of God. When somebody tells you, well, she didn't have the light on this, you better start running. <laughs> they don't believe in the spirit of prophecy. All right. Side issue. So verse 23, it says, The Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood, <laughs> when he does what? <laughs> when he sees sees the blood it doesn't matter what you believe it doesn't matter what you think he's got to see the blood when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts the Lord will pass over the door okay so there's something powerful building here in our understanding of the blood as we just look at these various times and ways in which it occurs. When I see the blood, we're going to spend a whole time just dealing with how does God get to see the blood? All right, number five. We find ourselves at Sinai. The people have been gathered there. And they are instructed to not come close to the mountain. There's a little fence put up. and said, you cross this fence, you have a big problem. Now, they spent three days getting themselves ready just to come that close. <laughs> okay? And they were still sinful. They were not ready to see a holy God. But by grace, he was going to appear right there. Jesus the, showed himself. The Father was there veiled. So the people came to Mount Sinai. And it happened to be on a Sabbath when all this happened. Yeah, they were there to worship on the Sabbath. God was the preacher for that day. Mount Sinai was the pulpit. <laughs> and the subject was the law. And so God delivered the law to them in a codified form. This is the beginning of that codification. And when the people found out that God was requiring them to keep the law, they said, we'll do it, but tell him to go away. Tell him to go away. We don't want a personal God. This is too much. This is too close. Leave the law. We'll keep it. And of course, they missed the whole point. And so God said, I must make a covenant with you. An arrangement whereby I say this, and you understand, and you say, yes, according to that covenant, not according to your ability. According to the covenant that I make. And of course, that covenant, let's read it. Exodus 24. Verse 8. God is going to seal this covenant with the people. And notice what happens here. It says, And Moses took the blood. <laughs> Nothing happens without it, you see. He took the blood and he sprinkled it on the people. Before it was on the doorpost. And now he's changing it. Now it's on the people. God is ratifying his covenant with the people by blood. Can't come any other way. And the way they can understand it is to have it sprinkled on them. They have the blood on them. So 
So once more, we begin to see the foundation of the power of God is in the blood somehow. Always the blood. There is absolutely no access to God without blood. This is the lesson we're picking up as we're going through the scriptures so far. There just is no way to approach God if the blood is not there. All right, just a little bit more here. Exodus 25, we're starting to come onto the familiar ground here. Verse 8, because that covenant has been established now, God says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell with them. You see, the people have had the blood sprinkled on them now. And so God says, I'm going to live with you. I'm going to be in your midst through the sanctuary. And so God says, because we have this covenant based on the blood, you can serve God in his own house now. And he makes the beautiful symbol of the sanctuary to show that that's what's happening in their lives. They may now worship him in his house. And he gives minute instructions as how this sanctuary will be conducted. And of course, we've been through a lot of this material together. And we know how small the details get. Over there in the Psalm, what is it, 77, it says that every Every whit declares the glory of God. Every detail of the sanctuary is telling us about his character. It's telling us something about him. And so God gives them all these direct instructions and he tells Moses 18 times, make it exactly like this. Make it exactly like this. Don't change anything. Make it like this. And God showed him a three-dimensional model so he wouldn't get confused. He said, make it like this. And so Moses was faithful, and that's what he did. And so the people are able to draw near to the king of glory now. And in the sanctuary, when you go through that entrance, the first entrance, what's the first thing you come across? The altar of burnt offerings. Blood. Nothing happens until you go through the blood. So immediately, the lessons are being perpetuated here. There has to be sprinkling there, morning through evening, all day long. Blood is the issue here in the courtyard. And of course, that blood makes its way into the holy place, sprinkling on the horns of the altar there. And then behind that curtain, that mysterious room, the most holy place, once a year, the priest goes in there with what? If he went in there without the blood, he'd be dead. He has to have the blood to go in there. God's idea is an all-pervasive thing coming through here. There's no way to deal with anything in the Bible without the blood. The ark was sprinkled once a year by the high priest. Worship, all worship of God involves the sprinkling of blood. And so... If you want to consecrate your house, there has to be blood. For the priest himself to be consecrated, the sprinkling again. When someone is born, blood. Penitence, festivals, no matter what you're involved in, throughout the period that we're discussing here, blood, always blood. The blood. All right, now let's go 1,500 years down here. We're up to number 7. And we now focus on Jesus Christ himself. 
the fulfilling of all these things that we've been seeing so far find themselves in what the Bible calls the Lamb of God. And of course, th that word lamb brings to mind immediately sacrifice. The sacrifice of God, the lamb of God. When John came, he expected the people of Israel to understand this thing about the blood. And he said, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. It's the blood that's going to do that. And they should have understood all of these things after all that history. He would fulfill the Old Testament. Let's take a look at John, the sixth chapter. Verse 53. And this has perplexed many people, but maybe we can see this more clearly. We're going to spend a whole time with this concept also. Verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. <laughs> oh, how he's saying it. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father. So, he that eats me, even he shall live by me. And so Jesus, when he said these words, put a divider up right away between the people that believe him and those that don't. The disciples that had been all around him following up till now, I said, wait a minute, he went too far now. They were gone. The Son, the Son of the Father. Have now indicated for all time in a way that cannot be misunderstood that restoration can happen in no other way than by dying the shedding of blood. Now this had been building all this time, but the thought was still so radical that even Satan couldn't put it together. He could not imagine what this really means. All this shedding of blood. And Jesus saying, you have to drink my blood. You see, Satan had said, God is selfish. And God is revealing through these two words that he, the Father, was willing to pay the price himself to restore humanity. But he would do it in Christ, which would be harder <laughs> to have his son do what he himself was willing to do. That's harder. You think about that as a parent, what you're willing to do. You're going to send your child out there to do it instead? <laughs> That's what Paul was saying. Paul understood all of this so beautifully. He said, the Father 
was reconciling the world unto himself in Christ. That's the word of God. It was the Father doing all of this. Through the blood of his Son. Man can live only through the death of another. Now this all seems so self-evident to us sitting here. But I want you to remember that if we can only live through the death of another, why are we so busy trying to get good so God can save us? Why are we so upset at really understanding we really are sinners? What would you say? Failures? Yeah, those fig leaves are everywhere, aren't they? We need to understand the blood. We're not going to get to the power of it today. That's in a couple of weeks. We're going to talk about what is the power of the blood? What can it do and why? Today, we just want to see what God has to say about it in a few places. So we see he means this. <laughs> Nothing happens without the blood. There's got to be a death so that we can live. And there's more than the death. We'll get to that too. But we want to see this first. Right here, Jesus has given us a very wonderful clue. We know that he died. We know that. We know that his blood is powerful. We know that too. One way or another, we know that. But it only works when you drink it. That's the part we're going to be talking about for the rest of this time on this subject. Nothing happens until you drink it. And when you drink it, then Jesus said, I am in you the same way the Father is in me. And you know what happens? Who has Jesus inside of them the same way the Father is in him? It's called holiness unto Jehovah. This is not a subject that we can look at as an alternative to something else. <laughs> this is the absolute center of the universe. This is the focal point of all redemption. The blood. Matthew 26, verse uh, 27. We'll start there. And he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And so when we sit down at communion... Unless we know that this is what's happening, we're missing the whole point. Jesus is saying, heaven is pouring forth the power of the blood during that service. The communion service is a time of joy because it is communion with the Father 
the Son and the Spirit unhindered. Nothing is in the way. And if you want to be sad, do it before at the ordinance of humility. <laughs> That's the time to confess how bad you are and to get right with people and all the rest of it. But once that's over, then the blood has worked and the power of it is in that communion service. He said, take and drink. This is my blood. Hebrews 9.22. This is a key scripture. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And so we now have two things that we will be able to concentrate on. First, there's got to be the shedding of blood. Nothing happens without that. And then secondly, there must be a drinking of the blood or we don't receive a benefit. So there are two things going on here. First, the shedding, but it's all under the heading of the blood. We're going to look at several sides of this before we're done. So, so far we have learned that Jesus has obtained life for us by the shedding of his blood. And having obtained that life for us, now he wants to share his life with us by our drinking by taking it inside, by making it us, by having him really there. So one side is for us. He did that without us. <laughs> and the other he does with us and in us. Both parts have to be there. Number eight. Let's look at Hebrews 9, 12. So there's some people who think the blood was just to take care of our sin problem here. He took away our sins. Now we're saved eternally. I can live any way I want. Hebrews 9, 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Jesus, by his own blood, entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So he went in before the Father with the blood. <laughs> and of course, don't get confused here in the holy place. This word is Hagia. That word is holy places. It means the sanctuary. Okay? He went before the presence of the Father. And before 1844, that happened to be in the first apartment. <laughs> okay? These are little details you don't need to worry about, except that somebody might try to confuse you sometime by trying to use these King James words to, words to prove things. Watch out. The King James was not consistent here in this Greek term. You get your Strong's Concordance out and you see where Hagia is used. Every time that word is used, it means the sanctuary, both apartments. All right. So, not without blood, Jesus went in to the sanctuary, the holy place, as it says in the King James here. Verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We're going to spend a whole time with this verse. How do we get a clear conscience? Okay? There are too many of us wandering around with guilt just streaming off of us all the time because our conscience won't give us rest. Well, we need to learn the power of the blood. 
Because it says here, he will purge that conscience with the blood. Ten nineteen. Having therefore, brethren, boldness, or the word is liberty here. We have liberty. We are free to enter into the holiest where God is by the blood of Jesus. The power of the blood is incalculable. We have not understood this. We have liberty through that blood to enter into where God himself is. With a clear conscience. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 24. Well, we can't just start right there. Let's uh, read verse 22 and go, move into it. It says, But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. See, that's who we are. We're the church of the firstborn. <laughs> Which are written in heaven... And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. <laughs> the blood of the sprinkling. One more there. Hebrews 13. 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. Do you see? Your sanctification is not you trying to make God appreciate you. Jesus is sanctifying you with his blood. We're never going to muster up enough capacity to do something to please God without the blood. But if we get the blood, something's going to happen. Okay. You know, we're all familiar with statements in Ellen White that we're not reaching high enough. We're not meeting the standard. We're behind the times. We, you know, and it goes on and on and we get all discouraged. Well, there's a reason for all of those statements. We are not drinking the blood. We want to do it ourselves. I don't care how much you say, I'm not into works. Yes, you are. <laughs> Any person who knows they're not fully surrendered to God, is trying to work their way to heaven. Verse 13. Let us go forth therefore unto Him without the camp bearing His reproach. Let's be like Jesus. Verse uh, 20. Now the God of peace. That's an interesting term, isn't it? Peace. That's what Christians have. Je didn't Jesus say, My peace I give you. Not as the world gives. 
my peace, what I have, the kind of peace I have, I'm giving you as a gift. The God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, our great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. That's interesting terminology, the everlasting covenant. What is that everlasting covenant? It's the blood all the way from Adam, all the way through. Who are Adventist people supposed to be? We're the people of the everlasting covenant. <laughs> We're the restorers of the breach. We're the repairers of it. Bring back the everlasting covenant. For some reason, we think the seventh day is the only part of that. No, the seventh day means nothing if there's no blood. It says through the blood of the everlasting covenant. That's the word of God. So we enter the sanctuary by faith and administer the blood immediately in our own lives. Have, open our hearts up to it. And then we move through the plan of salvation in the blood, through the blood. We have yet to see what that means, but we just want to know the Bible is saying these things, okay? There's no other way. All right, let's look at number nine. I'm sorry, we're not ready for number nine. I, uh, scratch that out. We're, we're not done here on <laughs> number eight. We were dealing with the central power of redemption. Okay. Romans, the third chapter. This is a keynote scripture. This one you can put a star next to if you wish. And really get a hold of this. Romans 3, 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in what? through faith in His blood. Now people say they have faith, and that's good that, that they want to have faith. But we can have faith in all kinds of things. You can even have faith in error. <laughs> you can believe things that are absolutely wrong. So you can have faith in lots of things. You can have faith that Jesus saved the world and still be lost. You can say you have faith in Jesus as a historical being. You know, he came, that he did this, he did that, he died, he went to heaven. You have faith in Jesus. But you're still not going to be saved. This scripture says what we're supposed to have faith in. We're to have faith in his blood. to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. There's something really important that we need to attach to here. Chapter 5, verse 9. Verse 8 to begin with. When I first saw this scripture, it just turned me around. I had been teaching some things that I thought were theologically correct. And then I realized, wait a minute, there's a side to this that I'm not seeing. And notice what it says here. 
God commended his love towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I thought that was a pretty good deal. I mean, well, I was a sinner. Jesus died for me. I had nothing to do with it. He did it himself without me. I didn't need to clean out my refrigerator. I didn't need to throw all the books away immediately before. I didn't have to do this or that. Well, I was a sinner. Jesus died for me. So the fact that I was a sinner didn't change anything for him. He loved me and he died for me. I thought that was really big and way out there as a thought. And then I read the next verse. Much more than. Oh, wait. <laughs> Much more than that? <laughs> Much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved. <laughs> now that's after justification. The blood got me in. But there's more. We shall be saved from wrath through him. That means I'm not looking back at the cross anymore. That got me in. But now, I know I have him. The blood gives me Jesus himself somehow. That's what we want to learn is what we get from the blood. Verse 10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Now you put two words under that. That's what woke me up. It hit me, two words after this scripture. We shall be saved by his life in us. <laughs> the same life Jesus has in us. So then it's no more me. It is not I that live, but Christ liveth in me. What do you think Paul is saying? <laughs> the real gospel is in the Bible, not in what people are telling about it. And not what you or I think about it. It's the way it reads. The mystery of God. Christ in you. The hope of glory. There's no such thing as a Christian that doesn't have Jesus inside of them. I've made quite a few people mad saying that, but it's the truth. <laughs> There's no such thing as a Christian that doesn't have Jesus inside. And there's only way he can get there. It's the blood. There's no other way. God himself has never put forth a different way. And he never will. Galatians 6.14 God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the death, there's the blood, the cross. 
The cross is not about that symbol. The cross is about the blood. This is why Paul, after he had dealt with the philosophers and the theologians and all the bright people on an intellectual level, he could meet them toe to toe. He was right there. But after he was done, he said, you know, I don't think I better ever do that again. I left out the blood. Left out the blood. And nothing happened. And so he said, I'm determined to never, never present anything but the cross of Christ from now on. The blood. And no matter what he was talking about from then on, lots of subjects, he was always talking about the blood. Because God was revealing who he was. And all the worlds that were watching the events and saw what Satan was doing, trying to kill Jesus off. I said, in this great controversy, who's selfish and who isn't, we see who it is. <laughs> and God is not selfish. Look at that cross. Colossians 1.20 Verse 19, it pleased the Father that in him and Jesus should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. To him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, God reconciled the universe, the creation, to himself through the blood. Ephesians 1, 7. Verse 6 for context again. This scripture to me is so clear what the real gospel is saying. It has been a scripture I've held on to for many, many years. It says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. That's our only acceptance with God is in Jesus, through Jesus. But that's enough, isn't it? <laughs> and then verse 7, in whom we have, not we're going to get it someday, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the richness of his grace so do we have sins today that are getting between us and the father not if you have the blood it says here we have redemption through his blood we have it by grace when we understand what the blood is, we will see we have been delivered. And we have a lot of overcoming to do, yes. But not to be delivered. We've got to admit who we really are. We have to admit that. 
We've got to know how rotten things are at headquarters. But we've got to know. God knows all about that. He already put that into the plan of salvation. It's all been plugged in. He knows what he's doing. The Father's happy with the blood. You know, he rejoices over the blood. Chapter 2, verse 13. But now you who were way out there away from God, who were far away from God, you've been made nigh close by the blood of Christ. He didn't say you're going to be someday. You have been by the blood. Nothing can get in the way of the blood. We have to drink it. <laughs> okay? That's our part. First Peter 1. Verse 2. He locked according to the foreknowledge of God. Did God know what he was doing? It says here he has foreknowledge. He has seen everything. <laughs> How can we ever surprise God? <laughs> How can we come up with something he didn't take care of? The foreknowledge. Let's not forget all these different elements about who God is. He looked according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. See, the blood is not on the lintel post anymore. It's on you. <laughs> it's been sprinkled on you. Verse 19. Verse 18 for context again. For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things. This is so important, we're going to spend an entire session with those words. The whole time. <laughs> you were not redeemed with corruptible things. The silver and gold from your vain way of living. Received by tradition from your fathers. Ooh, now we know where we got it from. <laughs> the people that came before us. <laughs> but with the precious blood of Christ. And that's what it is in the universe. Precious blood. It has done something nothing else can ever accomplish. Through the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. I hope you can appreciate a little bit more of why it kind of gets to me when I hear people say, Oh, Jesus was just like me. I hope not. I couldn't stand the worship of God just like you. Without blemish, without spot, holy, pure, undefiled, separate from sinners. I mean, you can go through the Bible and find all these things that describe who Jesus really is. We don't need people telling us their fairy tales. The blood of Jesus, it means something in the scriptures. It means something to God. God loves that blood. The precious blood of Jesus. Verse 20. 
verse 19. Uh, sorry, that's what we just did. Verse All right, 1 John 1. Let's go to 1 John 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For that life was manifested. We have seen it and bear witness. Okay, verse 7. If we walk in the light, the light of that person, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Oh, that's an interesting thought. People who have the blood love each other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from... How much? My Bible says all, nothing less. The Father looking at you today because of the blood sees no sin. All right, we have time to do heaven. What about heaven? Revelation 5, verse 6. I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. There's the blood in heaven. Ellen White saw the same thing. She, there was this poor little lamb with blood just all over. The blood in heaven, not just on earth doing whatever it does here, in heaven. Verses 8 and following. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood. That's their song in heaven, your blood. You have made us unto our God kings and priests. We shall reign on the earth. And we have shown a lot of interest in the, the, what we call the multitude in Revelation 7. What's going on over in Revelation 7, verse 14? It says, These are they which came out of the great tribulation. That's all the Christians. That's just not the little tribulation at the end. It's all the tribulation. These are they which came out and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The blood in heaven. Revelation 12, 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. You want to be an overcomer? The Bible's telling you how. <laughs> Not by you trying day and night. By the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. 
So we are to understand the purposes of God through all this. To enter into His joy, to receive the power of it. The blood of the Lamb. All right, let me try to finish up here what we've done so far today. This subject surpasses all understanding. Okay. We will be studying this throughout all eternity. What the blood really means. But God has no other means of redemption than the blood of Christ. All the wonders of grace focus right here in these two words. The light reflected from the cross is to show us this. Now I'm going to throw out a challenge to you. That's a challenge to me the same way. We must allow that blood to have the same place in our hearts as it does to God. To Him it's everything. That must be what it is to us. The same way. God rejoices in that blood. So this great mystery that we're looking at and trying to understand biblically, this mystery that comes out of divine wisdom, which is way beyond anything we will ever <laughs> fully appreciate. He puts enough of it out there for us to see to make it work for us and in us. And we're going to need to put some effort into this. Meeting here on Sabbath is one part of this. You have to go home and Bring this into your life. Dig for it. Search it out. Pray. Meditate. And try to get an understanding of how this is the center of your experience. In volume 6 of the Testimonies, Alan White says, We are to be exponents of the blood. Yeah, we as a people. I don't think we've done very well. When do you hear about the blood? We are to be exponents. So sacrificial blood always means the offering of a life. When the Israelite went to obtain blood for the pardon, he had to take the life of something that belonged to himself. Not somebody else. That sacrifice involved him. So Jesus is not the only one sacrificing. He's the only one who has met. But if we don't get his same spirit and also be willing to sacrifice, we have not understood what the blood means. The value of that blood. We'll spend our whole time on this one, trying to unravel it. The value of that blood depends on the life, where that blood comes from. And the value of the blood of Jesus is found in two, a hyphenated word, self-sacrifice. There are two kingdoms in this world. Those who live for self, and those who are unselfish. That's the only two kinds of humans there are. Because that's the only two kingdoms here. Unselfishness is what comes into the heart of the believer. A new life is implanted there. In that experience, we are learning to separate ourselves from sin. That's the life of an unselfish heart. Learning how to separate from sin. From self-will. We are not to live in the middle of our own thoughts. The Word of God is what a Christian seeks to live. To believe the same things that God believes. And so we are to trust Him. 
to reveal to us the power of the blood. He must reveal it to us. We must trust Him. And I think one way we can begin to get a hold of this is that He who gave it in the first place knows how to impart it to us after He shed His blood. He knows how. We must trust Him to think about it in just the same way God thinks about it. We must trust Him to work out the full merits of that blood. We must open our souls to receive the effects, the mighty effects of what the Bible calls the precious blood. And so as we go through this, we'll begin to understand more and more so that we can practice it every day of our lives going through that God means for that blood to work in your spirit and mine, in your life, to be the power of the way you live and to be the truth to you personally. All right, this is foundational today. We tried to see an overview. Next week, we will begin looking at some of these scriptures in detail. And some of these meetings we will have, we won't get over one scripture. <laughs> There's just a lot built into these that we need to begin to try to unravel and see what God has had out there for us this whole time. The blood. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you. But what you decided to do between you and Jesus, the covenant that you made with each other, involved a sacrifice we will never completely understand. It was done out of love to us. You were not willing that we should be lost eternally. And as radical as your answer was, you were completely successful. And the power has been unleashed in the universe that can never be called back. A power that really accomplishes what you set out to do. Help us, Lord, to open our hearts, our minds, our very souls to your teaching to your enlightening, to your bringing to us the true knowledge that we may no longer be bound to this earth by our worldly ideas. May we truly be citizens of that battle country. May we begin to sense that Jesus cannot fail. It's impossible. Bless us as we take time to study, as we make the effort to understand as we seek to open ourselves to your spirit, telling us the things we need to know. And we thank you that we are not creating something that's beyond us. You've already done it. We are just discovering. Help us to hold on to the things you reveal. And we thank you, Lord, that when Jesus comes, we can truly look up and say, we've waited for him. He will save us. We thank you in his holy name. Amen.